I don't know. My hair looks like it's like more poofy like today. I don't know what's going on right now. But we're here. Today we have a show for you. We have a star-studded show. Because again, I, it's funny because I've, I've heard of Shani Q over here. So I've heard of Shani Q, but I've never actually been in a room and had a conversation with her. So let's meet. Let's introduce our guest before we go into the topic. Please, everyone introduce yourself, starting with Shannon Q. Hi, I am Shannon Q. I have a YouTube channel called Shannon Q. I talk about the intersection of psychology and faith and also work towards progressing more p productive and constructive dialogues on complex issues. So if that's something you're interested in, go check me out. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And it's nice to meet you, Nate. Gee, I know you. It's nice to meet you, per per Perusha. I'm so and Callan, I know. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <clears throat> well, go ahead. Uh, and, um, um, oh. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, I'm Godless Engineer. Uh, I'm, I mainly do stuff here on, like, YouTube and Twitter and stuff. Uh, I really cover uh, science and uh, atheism and uh, sometimes politics. Uh, not so much lately. But anyways, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to be here as well. Let's go down to our uh, next Paula Jean. It's hard for me to read it. Please introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, which one of us are you addressing, sir? Well, how do you? Uh, it's hard to see your name. Is it Paula Jean? Oh, it's Perusha. Perusha, Perusha. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Perusha. Please introduce yourself. I'm sorry, my. Uh, Hi. Good to meet you, Nate. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Purusha. And uh Go ahead, Purusha. I'm a presuppositionalist. Well, it's nice to nice to meet you and have you on the show. Am I still roboting for everybody? I see Nate is a oh, robot. Nate is a robot. A desperately, desperately. What's hilarious oh is God. apology is my boyfriend too, so that's funny. I guess you and I are oh. dating now, Purusha. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's so small. Like, look at it from here. I'm like, this one, was that full of shit? I'm like, oh my god. No, no it's uh, not. <laughs> I feel like I'd recognize him. Oh my god. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to say our last best name. He's Please in introduce yourself. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Me? Yeah, go ahead. All right, my name is Kalon. I have, I'm on two channels. One is Sticks and Stonehenge, where we deal with polytheism and religion and stuff. And then I have my own personal channel where I pretty much cover whatever I want. Um, I also, I'm going to start dealing with more in criminology now since that's my area. And well, if I'm going to be made miserable by studying this subject, I'm going to make everyone else miserable by having to listen <laughs> about this subject. So yes, there you go. <laughs> I love you, Callan. <laughs> you All right. Hopefully this will clear it up because the camera is off. Okay, can you guys hear me? Am I still roboting? Am I still Johnny Five? Sounds yeah, like you're still T eight hundred. Ah, all right. I will live with T eight hundred. So, <laughs> so today we are talking about moralism versus moral anti-realism, right? So, who's on which side? Who here are holding the banner for the moral realism? That would be me. All right. So, can you can you give us a quick? introduction to the topic of what moral realism is and why you believe that it's it's true so should i go or do you want to go parisha i'll defer to you okay so to me moral realism is this idea that there exists something called moral facts now how we determine say the true value for these moral facts is a whole other beast but the sentence, for example, killing is wrong, has a particular true value of true or false, or in my case at least, 
it can be conditional upon what the situation is. And also when we talk about when I, at least when I talk about moral realism, the idea is more to think of it in terms of what are referred to as propositions. A proposition is a statement that can be either true or it can be false. And so when I hear, for, so for example, one of the few moral absolutes that I hold to exist is that rape is always wrong. That is a true or a false statement to me. And to me, that is a statement that is true unconditionally. There, that's my introduction to it. Great. Well, I think that you and I uh, are in agreement on that part of it, Kalon. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, Kalon. Um, actually, uh, God reveals in the scriptures that morality is real. And I had not actually even heard the term uh, moral anti-realism until after I was invited to talk on this show. And uh, I looked it up. And I found out that moral anti-realism simply means the position that uh, morality is not real. Um, it's kind of a strange position, I think, considering the fact that everybody uh, has moral positions. But anyway, the important thing is that uh, God reveals the fact that morality is real. And that's the important thing. All right, so I'm going to throw it up top to both Shannon Q and God's engineer. So you guys are holding the opposite view. Tell us about it. Go ahead, G. I can go after you. Okay. Well, um, I would label myself, I guess, as, um, you know, a moral subjectivist, I guess. Uh, I believe that our foundation of morality, our sense of morality is very subjective and it's prone to change, uh, you know, across cultures as well as uh, time frames. And so there's no, there's no, like, I guess, I, I, anything that I would consider a moral fact that is, has wow. been objectively true or false across, you know, uh, all time span or, or all cultures. Um, I, I believe that we all have a moral foundation with which we judge different situations to be either good, bad, right, or wrong, or I guess in this case, true or false. And so anytime that you, that any, anytime that you're using your own kind of, uh, I, I guess, judgment as to whether or not something is true or is false that would inherently make it, you know, subjective, I guess. Uh, so, I mean, I, yeah, that's my, that's my position. I'm, I'm a moral subjectivist. So you don't actually disagree with us in terms of like saying there are moral facts, but for you, what determines a truth value isn't inherent on anything objective, but rather it is a subjective value. Well, hold on. Before you answer that question, let me get Shannon Q to see just what if she has a different take or what her take is on the subject. Go ahead, Shannon, and we'll get right back to that. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, it was an interesting question, though. Uh, I'll do, without addressing the question, just so that we can get to it right after. Uh, I'll just state my position. I'm not philosophically adept, so this is just my layperson position. I think that a morality is a construct that's generated cognitively by humans and in, it's only objective in so much as it's grounded in our thought processes and only universal in so much as there's consensus on our agreement on what is or is not right. And even in those instances, you can find instances of a human where they may object, which kind of derails uh, to me the idea that it's universal, unilateral, and absolute. I think that if there were no humans, there would be no conceptualization of morality. For example, we don't extrapolate it out onto the animal kingdom. So it's unique specifically to Homo sapiens. And as such is a construction of a set of behaviors and interaction standards that we um, would like each other to adhere to in order to best instantiate a, a life that's beneficial to both ourselves and the group that we belong to. And because of that being the foundation for morality through the history of time and throughout in, and throughout societies, even within this time, it's a subject to subjective perspectives based on the context that it sits within. So that would be my position that it's a it's a construction that is found is grounded solely in our cognitive um, 
perspectives and because our cognitive perspectives are flawed, subject to change and not universally uh, adhered to throughout the entirety of human history or even the entirety of humanity as it exists right now, I find it very difficult to ground it in anything absolute. So that's my perspective. Okay. Let me let me let me point to Cologne because Cologne had a great question that, that, that let me just table. So I want to make sure we get back to that question because he asked it and see like there's some interesting conversation that come behind it. So Cologne, can you please repeat the question you asked earlier? So basically, what I'm gathering from both of you is that you neither of you are actually disagreeing with moral realism. What you're disagreeing with, from what from my perspective is that the true value can be objectively determined. Rather for you, it is subjective and dependent upon some sort of subjective feeling of the individual as to whether something is right or it is wrong. Well, I don't think that a moral fact can exist um, irrespective of a mind to conceptualize it. So if, if we're using ourselves as ontological grounding, for something being objective, I think that's shoddy grounding because you and mm -hmm. me could both answer uh, a moral question right. differently. And if we're if we're the sub if we're the objective grounding for morality, then there's a then there's an um, an inf infinite number of potential moralities. Right. But what I'm trying to um, do here is I'm not talking about objective versus subjective. Both okay. subjective morality and objective morality technically cake moral facts as i mean facts is one way moral propositions i think is the better term for it since okay. fact sort of implies this sort of objective notion to it mm -hmm. so without using moral realist language and moral um objectivist language mm -hmm. you're still agreeing that moral propositions exist you're just disagreeing with what their truth found it, how their truth is determined well i i mean i would say that the the wording of moral proposition versus moral fact have very different sort of implications. Cause I mean, a fact kind of implies that it's true by nature. But it, it, wh wh however it's propositioned, I feel like facts have to inherently be true. So if you want to say moral propositions exist, I would not disagree with the idea that moral propositions uh, exist so uh, it's it's just so, it's a very different it's very different uh wording there they so different let me so and let me I correct it, or not correct but but make sure i'm understanding the crux of what you're saying essentially it seems to me like you're getting at if you are willing to say that moral propositions exist then that's akin to saying obviously morality exists because if morality existed then there wouldn't be any necessity for moral propositions because morality isn't a thing that's part of what I'm saying, yes, although I'll try to articulate this position the best way I can. Sure. Basically, what moral anti-realists argue oh, mm -hmm. is that saying that killing is wrong is in itself a meaningless thing to say. <laughs> okay. Um, also, I want to get one other thing. So when I say fact, it's a little bit different of a conceptualization than necessarily something has to be true. Because when we're doing um, philosophical argumentation like this, we're in talking in propositions. If I say that certain fact X is false, that means that its negation is automatically true. Right. <laughs> and because of that, facts can be false in a sense as a shorthand for basically saying, well, its negation is true. Is that making sense? Yeah, that does make sense to me, but I'd like to ask a counter question because this is where a lot of it falls apart for me because this is where I don't think that there necessarily are such a thing as moral facts because they're imbued with so much contextual nuance. And I, in the discussion so that, I was having on Discord the other day, like the old, you know, is lying wrong? That's a true or false statement from a propositional perspective, right? Is it wrong? Yes. Is it right? Or is it wrong? Yes or no? Wow. Like if so, you say yes, it's wrong, and then you know you're you're hiding a Jewish person in your house, and a Nazi shows up at your door, do you lie? Well, we've already established that there's a moral fact that lying is wrong. So that is no long it's either no longer a fact or the proposition itself is entirely based on contextualization so and, right here's yeah. the here's the thing with that that gets into 
a different part of morality, and that is absolute versus mm -hmm. circumstantial morality. Okay. Absolute morality is within the deontological um, tradition of, say, Kant. Kant would actually say, yes, it's wrong to lie in that circumstance. It's actually on the Nazis that they're going to kill the Jew. It's oh. not a position I support. <laughs> that made but, my eyes cross. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's I Kant. I don't, I don't adhere to um, deontology and Kant's um, pure sense. I adhere actually to virtue ethics, but that's that's a whole nother matter. So basically what circumstantial morality says is that it takes a look at this and say, okay, well maybe this truth value about, so let's say for example, killing is wrong. Mm -hmm. That is a true or false proposition. However, that doesn't mean that proposition is necessarily true in all circumstances. So going out, pulling out a gun, shooting someone on the street is morally wrong. Mm -hmm. Is it? Not always. See, he's, he's on our team now. He turned him on. Back the shit out of him. Not on your team. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? I, let, me, let, let me say it this way. I, I think the, the, the is that you, it's a, it sounds like you're saying something could be a moral fact, but then you're you're still adding that subject yeah. and saying it, they, it can be it can be both well, the same. And it seems like everybody else is is, is not understanding that. Is it if it's a fact right. and it must be true, but versus if it's objective, it yeah. could be true. Could be right. True so I versus that moral, must be true. Right. So I don't necessarily that. mean it's true. You can't Wait. use the word fact unless it's true. Right. Um, the way I just defined fact you know, the way you basically define assumes that it's always true you know, because its negation can always be true. Yeah, that's how you defined it, but that's not the actual definition of the word. Look, things don't have one single definition necessarily. Things can have multiple say definitions. that they do. I no, say no. That we use well, the well, word. Hold on, hold on. Yes. There, 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 was, there was just a clarity of the word fact was that that's all that's all that happened here so just so so just to be clear when we when you said fact we're assuming that it must be true because the definition that we that i was applying to your scenario was that obviously that that's, is not what you're what saying you're so now since right. we, we understand that you're yes, using fact in that way can you just explain to what you're trying to explain again so, so right. we can now so, understand it in that context yeah so right when i say fact what i mean is something it, it's basically all, pretty much the same thing as a proposition a fact is something that can be true or false and if it's so can, what, see, to me that's can, can i can i can i can i present something here no it, just kidding go ahead <laughs> no uh -uh. no we're gonna what, shut you it, down would it be, uh, under, under your definition of a fact would then it be a fact that there is a purple dinosaur between here and mars if I if I present that as a proposition, does that make it a fact? No. Well, okay, uh, I get that. It, approach, it makes its negation a fact potentially, in your sense. In my sense, for okay, so I'm trying. Maybe okay, maybe let's not use the word fact. I'll just stick to the word proposition. I was using fact as a shorthand. That's better. Uh, so. What I'm going roughly saying is that the truth value of a particular proposition can depend on the moral, on the circumstances of whether it's true or not. So killing is wrong is true in the case when a person is innocent, right? I mean, I mean, is it? Presumably, it's what it seems to be. If you go out, you um, what, what if what if they're innocent and they're infected with uh, an advanced version of the coronavirus? So here's another term, caritas par uh, paribus, which basically means all things being equal. So all okay. things being equal, if I go out and shoot a random person, an innocent person, that is, there seems to be this intuition that that is wrong. And I would argue, and this will probably come in more detail later if we want to go into it, that it's wrong because it affects the functioning of society. But that's a whole different um, other topic. This topic is just about whether they're whether moral moral we're not propositions talking about grounding of moral facts we're talking about well, whether or not we are, don't make moral propositions it seems to me that there are no actual uh, moral anti-realists here the two fellows on the top said that they uh that they were object uh, subjectivists 
Right. right. And that's and that's what and that's why I think we should probably move this conversation from do moral facts exist to is morality objective or subjective? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I don't even think moral facts <laughs> exist though. Well, it's not like the disagreement we're about. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Perusia. Shannon, you keep saying that moral facts don't exist. No, because I think they're entirely contextualized based on in uh, based on human perspective. So they're not in like I don't think that I. Well, maybe I'm I'm not super philosophically grounded, so I could be wrong. Oh, yeah. I don't think no. that when I think fact, I think that it is true irrespective of the context. It is either true or false without contextualization. So, what do you mean by I, exist here? Shannon. Mean do you what mean I, like it exists mine independent or what? What what Shannon was trying to was trying to answer a question there, Kellen. Yeah. So when I think about a fact, I think that it's going to be static over time. So it's going to be true no matter what the circumstances are surrounding it. It's really? not going to require contextualization. Like, oh, actually, mm, when you say really, like I could, I, when I, I think about moral facts, I think that's the way I think about it. Like, maybe I am more subjectivist than... You that you're making this up as you go along. I seem thinking. like I'm making. It, I've, I've I've already established a couple times that I'm not philosophical. I'm here to engage in a conversation so that I can potentially yeah. learn. If but, you're going to utilize this as an opportunity to attempt to to, to make, make me feel um, like I'm like I like I'm silly, see, then it's not yeah. going to work out well for you. Yes, me. I think so. So I think it, like you're making it up as you go along. No, uh, I'm asking no, questions no, no, no. and exploring what I think about it. And as I said, yeah. if you're going to yeah. utilize this as an opportunity to attempt That's to make me feel silly, this isn't going to be a constructive conversation. So you so can I'm either a change your tack and approach when you're engaging in, with me what? so that we can have a productive conversation well, or yeah. we can continue it's like this. productive to make stuff up as you go along, though. Oh, no, 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 let, let, let's, 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 let's all calm down. Let's all calm down. Let's all yeah, calm let's down. Stay calm. Let, let, There's yes, no yes, need yes. to. There's no need for attacks here. We're, we're, um, we're all on we're all what? on topics. We're we're all learn, we're all trying to figure stuff out, and uh, and actually we're having a very good conversation. So let's try to get back. We were to the topic at hand, and the topic at hand was you seem like the disagreement here is starting with are do moral facts exist? And I think Shannon was eloquently explained to us what she meant by yeah. something being yeah. a fact and a moral fact, and we we got caught up on the fact on the, on the issue of. Whether that moral, whether she was thinking of a moral fact, she be thinking about it differently, not as a regular everyday fact, right? Am I, am I, am I there? Yeah, I think that that's fair. So, like when I think about moral facts, I think mentally, I I think that they're going to be true over the spectrum of time, regardless of the context of a society or a culture or a religion or any individual human perspective. If there's a moral fact, then those contextualizations shouldn't necessarily matter. Um, otherwise, it's not a fact consistently. So that would mean but that, objective morality. So, well, wait, okay, so. What you described as objective yeah. morality. Hold on, hold on, just, just one, one, one at a time. Um, okay. go, go ahead, Perusia, and then Colin, go ahead. Well, I, I still haven't gotten an answer to the original question, really, uh, what I was getting at. But I think that what Shannon just described is uh, ordinarily called objective morality. Yes, he's calling objective facts. So I think we're. we're I was talking about morality. To the idea that we're not, we don't have moral anti-realists here. We have moral subjectivists here. Yes, that's correct. We've established that. Yes, that's correct. But the thing is, Shannon kept saying that she doesn't believe that moral facts exist. Yes. Right. So when you say that you're actually making a statement about the subject of morality. You realize yeah. that, don't you? Well, we're talking about morality and that is the subject. And I made a statement about it, so I'm, I'm acutely aware. <laughs> yes. Excellent. <laughs> yes. So I'm with you. was your statement factual or non-factual? My statement was an, uh, was me giving my perspective on a situation that I'm currently so exploring. Oh gosh, presuppositionalist, my gracious. Like, so I was giving a perspective on what I think about this and in, in the hopes that I could explore it further. So 
my statement to me was a fact based on my perspective with me as the grounding for my statement. So I'm utilizing myself as the grounding for my perspective. Since I'm the grounding for my perspective from me, that is a fact. That, the fact is that that is my perspective. Is that an absolute fact grounded in throughout time? Potentially not. Yeah, but I wasn't asking if it was your perspective or not. I'm that, telling you that can I, to me, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? We're getting a little trapped. Trap. I'm, trying, I'm trying to get somebody else in here. Real quick. There's a pre up at every party, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's not a party to a pre there to ask you what your facts are grounded in and not listen to me. We're going to come back. Can I, come on. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask your question. Can I try to? Um, all right. I'll, I just want to try to clarify. The question that I asked that hasn't been answered. What well, let me I think, Let me try to. About morality. Please. Or not? All right. Well, hold on. Well, we're what? gonna come back. Arusha, you were you I... recognize that you're not the only one in this conversation, correct? I've spoken less than anyone else in this conversation so far. And you keep talking over everybody. Can you learn how to have a conversation, please? Shannon talks. You listen, and then you respond after she gets done I talking. I That's how conversation I, uh, works. You. I would like to try to have to a conversation a, here. A lesson from someone like you, sir. Okay. Let, all right. Let, we can all get on a better page. This is a this is a great conversation for people oh, so to do it. It's an important one for all of us to explore. Yeah, yeah. I will apologize if I was cursed to you, uh, Kersha. Yeah. So we can all get back on the same. Yeah, I already asked you. Okay. I'm attempting to apologize to you. So give me a moment, please. There's no need to apologize. What you should do is apologizing is address the actual question that I. Oh, have. for the love of all things. Okay. What was your question, right, please? Listen, pose uh, it to me on, again so that I can. Hold on. Hold on. And I'll well, yes, yes, yes. So we can get past, we can, we can get past this mean, question. Hold on. Come on. Yeah. So, so, ask so me the question. Everybody the question. else, for a second, ask me the question. Excuse me. What's the question? Back to the question, which you've avoided for the last five minutes. Okay. You made a statement regarding uh, morality. Mm -hmm. That statement was that moral facts don't exist. I'm asking you if that statement of yours was factual or not. I'm not asking if it was your opinion or not. I'm asking if, if it was a fact or not. There's no middle ground. It's either a fact or not. I want, I want to be certain that you're finished so that I can commence. You've interrupted me many times already. Go ahead. I, I've apologized for that. For interrupting you, so we can continue going forward. So you, I, I, I'm. So you, yeah, are you done? Are you are you done? Can she answer? Can she answer? Are you done? Okay, okay. So we're gonna let. So we're throwing the mic to Shannon. Go ahead, <laughs> Shannon. You have you have the mic. Answer. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that that I'm not continuing the same pattern that I that was derailing the conversation. So when I say that I don't think that moral facts exist. That is me saying to you that from my perspective, which is grounded in me, right. I don't go on. I, are you sure? <laughs> I don't think that moral facts exist. It's something that's difficult for me to consider. Okay. All right. You know what? You just go. So Can I? A, we'll all listen to you. It's Can a, I please? Because you're not interested in listening. Callan, absolutely. Please go ahead. <laughs> all right. So I, so yeah, I was thinking about it. I think here's an easier way to um, express what is being said. Okay, so we have ethical sentences, right? Sentences that discuss what is true, what is proper, what is not proper, right? So killing is wrong is an ethical sentence, right? Right. Can that be right? Can that be right or wrong in any sort of sense, in a subjective sense, in an objective sense? Cal, I'm so sorry, Cal, that wasn't a reaction to you. Okay, um, hold on just a second. We're going to put a pause on the show real quick. We're going to put a pause on the show, folks. Now. Cal, that was a good question. Can I, I'd like to pursue it. I'm so sorry. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm just cutting in real quick. Now I'm censoring you because you're disrupting this conversation. I invited these folks here to have a decent conversation. And I sat here as they patiently try to be very, very cordial with you. So if you're going to be like this, I'm going to just remove you from the show. Oh, is he, oh, is he gone? Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, Prusha, that we weren't able to have a 
better dialogue with you. Callan, do you mind repeating the last part of that question? Because I think that's a wonderful question. And the three of us were having a wonderful conversation. So I'd very much like to continue pursuing it because I love this subject matter. Okay. So I'm going to define a term ethical sentences. Ethical yes. sentences talk about particular acts in a fashion such as killing is wrong. Mm -hmm. Can this sentence be true or false? That is, can it express a proposition that it could be subjective grounding? It could be objective grounding. It can mm -hmm. be whatever grounding you want. Is there a certain sense in which this sentence expresses a proposition? Yes. I would okay. say so. GE, would you agree with that? That like context considering that it could be subjectively contextualized. You could say killing is wrong. And if we you and I agree that we don't want to kill people and somebody says killing is wrong, or that we don't want to be killed ourselves, we could say that's true or false based on our perspective, even and that would still make sense. That's well, the way I see it. I, I mean, I, I I would agree with the truth value or uh, agree or not agree, you know, with the truth value subjectively. So uh, yeah, I, I guess I guess so. Uh, but I, I would still say that that's still a subjective type of morality because you're still. I mean, that's fine. That's, that's fine. The chat. Yeah, that's that's completely fine. That answers the question. Both mm -hmm. of you are moral realists, perhaps subjectivist. That's fine. That's okay. All. Yeah, nuts. Okay, <laughs> that's something here. I've been playing. I've been playing a very Sokka. Sokka is actually the one who helped me get to the 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 asser, to ascertaining that I was probably a moral anti-realist. Cogn I'm a cognitivist, anti-realist, subjectivist. When we went through the that's flow the chart, that's like a mouthful <laughs> right there. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, for me, and uh, at least I know for me in class, subjectivism was defined pretty much just under um, moral realism because it still agrees that th that something can be true or false. A moral proposition can be. It just simply exactly. Yeah. Answer the question. The, um... Sorry, just kidding. I thought that's how conversations went. My bad. <laughs> can, I, can I just jump in on for one quick second? Um, no. Go ahead, Saka. Yeah, okay, sure. I so, you, so I think that what, one of the things, and uh, uh, this is for like, everybody in the room. Um, when when we talk about moral facts, okay, when we're, we're um, and and I like the way that uh, Kaylin kind of rephrases this because uh, she's right here, that um, that if you believe that um, uh, moral proposition, uh, moral statements um, are propositional based, you know that 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 uh, that makes you a realist, but it also makes you an anti-realist. You know it, what you're saying at that point in time. You're 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 a cognitivist at this point in time. You you're, you're hearing the utterance of this statement. And, and it makes sense to you as a proposition. It does make sense to you. The, the difference between you know, when you go into we're talking about moral realism now and moral anti-realism is whether or not those statements can be true. So, so for example, um, if you're a moral realist, you know you could believe that these uh, that these statements can be true because there's some truth-making fact about reality, independent of ourselves, that make these statements true. But if you don't think that these things exist independently of us, that uh, essentially that uh, you know maybe if you're like uh, like a uh, like an error theorist, like that uh, that all these propositions are false because there's no truth-making properties to them. There's nothing inherent in the universe about rightness or wrongness or good or bad or good or evil or anything like that. Like those concepts are just made up by us. Yeah. And because of that, there's nothing that actually points that. So if you say that this is right or this is evil or this is wrong or anything like that, it is that those statements are pointing to a truth maker of that statement that doesn't actually exist. In which case, while the statement makes sense as a proposition, it doesn't actually, it can't be true because there's no truth making value to it that exists independently of us. So if you believe that, it, yeah, of course, yeah, it's a proposition, but it can't be true because it depends on, you know, maybe a linguistic thing that we use or something like that, then then you're an anti-realist. So that's a better way to kind of like, uh, you know, dive into, you know, the anti-realist position. Don't I okay, think that I might be. That. That's a so, little bit so different. Than, hmm, sorry. Now, if I'm understanding it right, just so that I'm making sure I'm on the right page here, uh, that's more of an absolute, like, like moral realism is more about, uh, like moral absolutism, like there's an absolute answer to a moral proposition. So it's absolutely true, this particular statement, and not subjectively true, 
well, circumstantially, I think is more of what you're getting on to, but yeah, roughly that G. Okay. Is that right, Sokka? Sokka's probably got 48 kids, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I wanted to make that point because I don't, I, I really don't want to interfere too much with the conversation just that because we get this bogged down in this point. Because if you simply acknowledge that moral, you know, that moral propositions make sense, you know, that they, oh yeah, these are something that, yeah, uh, if we represent this as, a, we can see this as a proposition, that makes sense, yeah, that doesn't make you a moral realist. That's that's the point. Um, but what what the, what makes you a, a realist or an anti realist is whether or not those statements can be true independent of anything about us you know they could be true regardless of our opinion or that, that there's some inherent value of reality that makes so that those statements to me true. was um defined to me at least from my own philosophical uh teachers as mo as objective morality whereas moral realism is whether or not ethical sentences can express an actual proposition. Moral re anti-realist would deny that they can. Yeah so, yeah, so so moral objectivity and moral subjectivity are two topics that you're not going to really approach a lot in um, like actual ethics or uh, morality discussions because they uh, the, the nuance of that language is just, eh, it, it doesn't really make sense. Okay, it, it I depends mean, on how you look at it. It made perfect sense the way it was presented to me. One is belief-based, so that is moral values are based on individual beliefs about whether something is true or false. And the other is grounded in some sort of external factor such as um, maximizing happiness or- no, that's, that's, that's wrong. Uh, that you're, you're getting into normative ethics now where we're asking about how we can analyze certain propositions. You know, that's, that's not about dealing with actual, whether or not these moral facts exist or not. That, well, Yeah, it, it, well, once you, yeah, once you start getting into that stuff. No, like, I mean, the first yeah. part though was, it was about whether ethical sentences express a proposition or not yeah and that and the, the differentiation between those two positions would only get you to whether you're a cognitivist or a non-cognitivist okay so you you're putting basically what you're doing is you're putting what i would call moral anti-realism and moral realism as cognitive and non-cognitive is that correct no no, uh, uh, if, if a statement makes sense as a proposition, so if, if the, the, you hear the statement, um, uh, stealing is wrong, and that makes sense to you, that represents an actual proposition, that you agree that, this, that it makes sense as a proposition, th then you're a cognitivist. If, if you don't, then you're a non-cognitivist. So an example of that would be a motivism. So if, if you hear the statement, stealing is wrong, and, and really what that translates to is like uh, some type of uh, position like a motivism, um, where the statement stealing is wrong pretty much much just means boo stealing you know then that doesn't yeah, that's the motive well. which is an anti-realist position no that's an that's a non-cognitive position that's not an anti-realist position i was okay yeah. well then i think there was just some sort of discrepancy between what we were probably both taught right. and yeah. because that is what i was taught was pretty much an anti-realist position because there is no sort of the ethical the sentence there isn't expressing any sort of proposition it's just expressing an emotion you basically are just translating the sentence over into an emotion stealing is wrong just simply means boo to stealing yeah oh, that's a motivism which is a non cognitive position yeah and that's little, not where little, i fall yeah so it's a little different so anti-realism like i said is that uh, so so here's the thing so if, if the question was to to shannon and godless engineer um, that uh, do you believe that there are truth-making values of reality that make moral propositions true independence of human thought? No. No. You're anti-realists. Yay! Yay! High five. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm mirrored. <laughs> this, this is lame. Boom. Yay! <laughs> we are anti-realists. That's what I thought. Because I, well, I went through the gauntlet the other day with Sokka, and he told <laughs> <laughs> and he told me I was. I'm less interested in the like the the philosophical label that's applied to me as I am in the the concepts and the grounding. Like one of the reasons I think these discussions are important isn't so that we can determine which camp we fall in. It's because that's what helps all of us come closer to an understanding of what morality really even is. And I think a lot of the reason that people fall on the side of, you know, realism or objectivism is because the conceptualization that ultimately it's up to us is fucking terrifying because we suck at almost everything for the most part when it comes to engaging with one another. So 
But if the that's um, the case, then and if it really is up to us, and if I really am right about my perspective, we all need to get on the same page relatively quick. Sorry, uh, I just want to point out, like, uh, because Nate was having uh, some comms issues, that's why I, I asked to, to step in to try to keep this, uh, keep it mm -hmm. kind of going there a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to step back and I'm going to try to be a little bit more of a moderator on this one uh, sure. now for like the, the rain. I want to believe you, Saka. I want to. <laughs> <But, so, so laughs> I want to believe you so bad. <laughs> uh, now, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Shannon, but the, the issue with that is that, like, um, that the, the, the fact to, to say that a moral realist, mm -hmm. um, that that position is a comforting position or somebody would take that position because, um, you know, the, the, the thought of the alternative is uh, terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. Like, th th I think that that, that that applies to a lot of different motivations or feelings to people that are moral realists that I, I don't think they actually subscribe to. Because uh, I don't think Callan would say that they are more realist only because the the opposite, yeah, uh, the, the the thought of uh, moral facts not being true is terrifies them. No, it it doesn't at all. That's just to say that it's just an appeal to emotion, which is itself a logical fallacy. No, to, I understand that that I understand that to be fair, and I wasn't using it in like the the philosophical. The only reason you adhere to it is this, but I would say that generally. There are people, not speaking of people in this room, or maybe even people watching, that, and even me, like, I'll just, how about I just speak for myself? There was a time in my life, and maybe this is just me projecting, that I wanted there to be absolute facts in regard to morality because, the, because the, like I said, the idea to me that just people were up to figuring out what is right and wrong it just seemed horrifying so i wanted to adhere to some standard that existed outside of me that i could point to and say well that's what we have to do it's not up to us and once i came to the realization and this is a personal realization i'm not saying that i'm right or wrong that oh shit it is up to us that came imbued with some emotional baggage maybe other people don't you know feel those feelings when something like that happens maybe they don't contextualize what that means on bro to broader society and conversations in context but that's something that it meant to me so i don't think it's it's a fair criticism to say that i unfairly uh articulated it as though that is the case for everyone but i think it's important for us to understand that it could be the case as it was for me for for many people and it's one of the reasons that I held on to it for so long. Is that more fair? Did I articulate that a little better? I mean, okay. It's... All right. Good, good talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I... Oh, go go ahead, G. Oh, I was just going to ask Kalon. Um, now, you you think it would it be true to say that you think that these moral propositions can be true or false irregard or not irregardless but regardless of like human opinion like they they exist yeah. outside of our so i'm kind of curious like how do they exist outside of ourselves uh like I, I guess i just don't understand how that works like are you attributing it to any I'm particular like to, deity um, or god or no sorry, i'm attributing ahead. it to human functioning which is basically aristotle's argument um as a matter, in a manner of speaking, that is, if a fun if a human is functioning well and like society as a whole is functioning well, then we are flourishing, and flourishing is a state that is desirable, and because it is desirable, anything that gets in the way of that flourishing is automatically um, deemed immoral. So, to give an example to a probably very highly complex topic that could go on for hours, the person who is let's just say he's drunk all the time he's beating people up and stuff of that nature that person is objectively in the wrong because he is harming people and that is preventing other people from flourishing and having beneficial experiences mm -hmm. if i'm making okay. sense because this is a it's it's a complex topic what if all those people are what? nazis and they're killing people oh that's fine the, just go ahead See? and kill the Nazis. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nazis are automatically on, are automatically non-functional so, to society. So just toss them. But, aside. No, I'm but the real moral question is: Is it okay to punch a Nazi? 
Sure. It's I'm sorry. I, <laughs> well, let, let's let's take a look at the uh, the, the for, for the anti-realists. Okay, is that one of the issues then that well, one of the benefits of uh, a system that that Callan's putting out there is that um, you know that that there you could always point to something yeah, a, 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 as right or wrong. Like they they have that that those truth-making values to them that make these things objective facts of reality. Now, now it, it, the natural realist. One of the problems that we have is that they, it, it, a lot of it comes down to functionality within these systems here. So you could have a society. So we can bring up the example of, um, like, uh, like the Nazis, or, or we can take a look at other cultures out there right now, or primitive cultures that conducted human sacrifices, and, and, and those acts uh, helped with the society function overall. Except we did it, though. That's what we think. What happened with the Nazi society? Okay. Um, okay. This is a question for the the anti realists. Is that, let's say let's imagine that a society can have uh, um, uh, certain beliefs or habits that help with uh, how that society functions. Um, at, uh, human sacrifice, for example. Um, there, what is the, the the criteria that you can criticize any of these other societies as doing things that are wrong? Uh, simple. They are hampering this, this, the flourishing. The, for the anti, this is for the anti-realists. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Never mind. Go ahead. I thought that was for me. No, no, no. I'm uh, because you have a system. Yeah, like I said, that uh, yours is going to be based off of uh, the, whether they're flourishing or not. But right. you know, th that that would be the assumption that you're the, the assumption that's grounding your position is that there is an objective way that a society can run for it to function properly. The potential that I would be the one that might next be sacrificed would be one thing. Like, so individual fear that this this practice is putting me individually at risk and I should be compelled to convince other people that that's not beneficial because it could also be them. None of us want it to be us. So perhaps we should look into other and explore other ideas so that we don't have to engage in or realize that this is a useless practice. So what happens if it's completely voluntary? If it's completely voluntary, like... a that th we can get into euthanasia arguments too, like if you want to, but I think that people are autonomous. So if you want to make a choice, I can, for selfish reasons, try to convince you not to volunteer to go into this human sacrifice because it's going to affect me. It's going to affect the larger group. I can have those conversations with you, but ultimately, do I have a right to interfere with your autonomy? Can I, can I stop you? I mean, potentially I could. I could hold you against your will until I can convince you otherwise, maybe, or hold you against your will to a certain point until I'm ultimately punished for holding you against your will. But ultimately, there's multiple contextualizations that we have to look at. We have to look at how the society functions, what the consequences are going to be for me if I do something like that, what the consequences are going to be for the person if they don't do something like that. It all comes down to cost-benefit analysis that's contextualized within the, within the society that's built by human minds. Like All of these scenarios have to do with a society that was constructed by people to determine what's best for that group. Now, we, based on our perspective, can look at that group and say, well, based on the society that we've constructed that's best for us, we think that's reprehensible. And we're able to make moral pro proclamations based on our context that we see as relatable to this context, when really the contexts aren't the same. But does that mean that like, I think that maybe my morality might be better than some other people's morality, but what is that grounded on? I don't have a necessarily good answer for that except for rationalizations. And rationalizations and contextualizations aren't absolutes. If somebody has a better answer for me than rationalizations and contextualizations that 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 is based on something absolute, please give me access to it. I'd love to see it. Well, so one thing that I'm still a little confused on here with, with Callan's position is the the fact that you define flour like human flourishing and success of society. You you subjectively define that as the goal, and then you are then judging, you know, whether or not something is right or wrong based off of that subjective foundation. 
So to me, following it back to its foundation, it still just seems subjective. Like I feel, I, I still feel like it's subjective to say that the goal of humanity or society, uh, I guess, um, is, is to flourish and to grow and to survive. Uh, it still so, feels like a subjective, uh, you know, thing to say. So when I say good, sure, that's a value judgment, but I'm also looking along a scale of pretty much total destruction versus total flourishing. So, well, I mean, that's let's not, say, let's, so here's a thought Sorry. example. Let's say I have a society, a small village that's just filled with serial killers, for example. Okay. How well is that society? And by in this society, let's say that there's no laws saying you can basically kill whoever. How long is that society going to continue to function for like a machine? Well, I mean, why why does why does the goal of that particular society have to be continued to function like for ever or whatnot? Same also, thing for any uh, other uh, organism. I mean, well, I'll, I'll, also, I I feel like looking at this is is a, a really like dichotomous way of viewing things. Like it's it's just only looking at the extremes and not looking at the nuances that exist between. Well, the what I'm doing is I'm building. So, like for example, I will readily acknowledge is that certain civil that certain p places have different levels of functioning. That doesn't impact my argument at all. What I'm doing is I'm building from extremes towards more nuanced ideas. So, basically, for example, this is a society can you can still have moral errors in a society. It's just a matter that if those moral errors weren't there, the society would be better functioning. So. For example, uh, let's take uh, let's take rape. There's never a circumstance in which rape helps the functioning of a society. It I doesn't agree. Help. And okay. so, from that perspective, from this sort of system that is outside, from judging society from that angle, that determines that basically there's no need for rape and therefore rape is itself objectively immoral. As in when I say objectively immor immoral, it means that it doesn't, it doesn't add anything. It doesn't like doesn't that contribute just, to functioning. Doesn't that just make moral systems uh, n necessit necessi necessary actions in order to guarantee the continued propagation of a species? No, not necessarily. It's, Excluding so, all other actions, because that would so essentially flourishing make refers to a state where basically, let's say everyone was morally perfect and nothing like that. Have this is I'm trying to think of the best way to present this because I don't think there is because I think that it's all contextualized and there's no scenario you can find that doesn't have an exception. That's what I think. I think that every scenario you find, there's always going to be a goddamn exception because life's a there's no black or white there's no true or false that. propositions because in any context where there's a true or false proposition is this right or is that this wrong the same action in another context could be right based on justifications and context and if justifications and context are what morality is then morality is just a big mess of our behaviors and what we feel is best in the moment based on our justifications so one thing, I'm not an absolute mor moralist. I don't believe in necessarily in absolute morality. I believe that there are certain morals that I have found which are absolute. Mm -hmm. That is, when I say absolute in this case, that means I cannot think of or come up with a situation that would right. justify a certain action X. Right. Uh, for example, rape. I'm Don't never dare try to justify rape, John. I'll jump on you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you just put your finger not... up like that at the wrong time. <laughs> One sec. <laughs> no, I, I'm so sorry. I, my finger was not to do that particular action. I, I just, I was like, I've got something to say. So, so like, let's, let's, take, science for, let's take science as an analogy, for example. Science itself, people tend to think of as an objective process. Yes. So with morality, the way I view sort of this virtue efforts in human flourishing is that it's on the progress to like not causing trauma, not causing harm, to basically enhance societal functioning. How do you get to so, that as a grounding though? 
So the meta, so the grounding. Like ontologically, how do you look at that and say, I can say with absolute certainty that this is where we derive moral facts from. So I look at for, so for example, basically, um, basic suffering, basically. What can cause the least Same question. Of why, why is that, why is that what we look at? Why? Well, I mean, because that's what hampers the um, society. That, that's what hampers the society. Talk about the moderator. Yeah, about. yeah uh, I mean, <laughs> like, a good, uh, like uh, the, the, I think that one of the the issues there is uh, with uh, that question, Shannon, is that I, I think that within some systems, like the, the the systems get defined by what morality is, and by just by, by by definition. So if if morality is defined as those actions that any rational person would put forward uh, to help uh, uh, society to flourish, mm -hmm. okay, um, sure. well then the implicit within the definition itself is actually you know well that's what morality is. So when it becomes an objective fact because we can measure those things and, and the definition we agreed upon the goal. Well, it, it's not this. It's, that's what we're talking about. It's defined. Well, then, like, I, I just don't know how anybody can get to, like, I would just like there to be some sort of consensus as to even what morality is. And it just doesn't even seem plausible or possible to even get to. That's why it seems like an incoherent mess to me, because it's all contextual and you can't, you can't figure out the grounding. It all comes down to we agree upon it, ultimately. And so that makes it objective because we agree it. upon it. What happens if there's an exception to that? Like well, there is the um, the science of positive psychology, which virtue ethics is grounded on, mm -hmm. which is basically living your best functional life as you best can. And these are based on various things called virtues, which are acquired by individuals. So yeah, for I agree those are good things. But why do I agree that those are good things? And why is that the goal that we should agree upon? Well, and the, what makes it objective? It's not so much a goal that's necessarily agreed upon. It's just talking about the functioning of human beings. If someone is functioning, they're happy, healthy, all these other things. Whereas mm -hmm. if they're not functioning, then there's some huge issue that's preventing them from functioning. So, like, we go back to the example of a drunkard who um, beats his um, family. Right. That function. That family is a objectively not functioning because the drunkard does not have the virtues of say um, what virtue would apply here a self-control mm -hmm. because the, the drunkard doesn't have this virtue of self-control everyone else around him is suffering and overall harm is coming to that family as an objective fact based mm -hmm. on him not having acquired those virtues well so the the issue that I have with, with the conversation, um, which for one I, I did write down a note that uh, like the scientific method isn't in an, in and of itself like objective. It just tries to remove as much subjective bias as it can. And, and, and there's there's obvious examples of where you know people have misused this a scientific method and uh, have you know, come out on, on the wrong side of a particular uh, situation, which was then corrected by the very same scientific method. But all I mean is, is that like, it's not objective, like in and of itself, like we, we are the ones that try to make it as objective as it can be, but we're still limited by our own subjective, like appearance, uh, uh, um, uh, experiences and uh, our own subjective like application of it. So I'd, I would, I would be hard pressed to defend a position that says science or the scientific method is like inherently or always objective. I just, I, 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 I wanted to throw that out there, but also um, in, in the conversation, uh, the larger conversation of, of morality uh, of this objective nature of morality, I think that, for, for me, it seems to be confusing, you know, judging particular actions with your own subjective moral foundation as being right or wrong, and then uh, confusing that with saying, oh, well, then this is objectively or absolutely the correct answer, when if you take a look across timeframes, you, you, you get different 
kind of answers to different moral propositions as to whether or not they're absolutely right or wrong, because uh, I'm not going to go into the whole rape well, no. issue. But so the it, um, answer for that, actually, is that we, in general, we tend to see a trend of sort of advancing morality. That is, people become more moral as time goes on. So, for example, as you have the Romans not thinking that rape is wrong, well, so long as it's outside the tribe or something of that nature. Well, that was back then when humanity was at that stage in development. And as we keep going forward, we keep learning more and more about morality. Well, yeah, but you, you have to you have to understand that within within a particular culture, it can be seen as perfectly moral to own another person. And, uh, th and that culture, I can say, is objectively wrong under my system. Well, uh, under your subjective system. I mean, I feel like it's that's just playing word against the word objective. Well, maybe if I could jump in for a quick second just to uh, kind of clarify the point here. Um, so, for example, the... The, uh, if it was the case that that moral facts do exist independent of ourselves, during the, 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 we were talking about that uh, we would possess some type of method in which we can discover them. Okay, and uh, if you want to use kind of like a science analogy to this, take a look at something like the age of the Earth. Okay, the, the age of the Earth has uh, has changed uh, uh, various times um, when reported. So, so, like you know, it started off as a couple hundred thousand years, a couple million, and now I think well, what are we at? Like three point six billion or something like that. Now, the the thing is that the the objective, the the actual state uh, of affairs of the age of the Earth hasn't changed, but what was refined was our ways to discover how old the earth was, the, the tools that we had, the, the ability that we have, the knowledge of how these things worked. So, so if you took a look at like somebody like, um, uh, like, a, like an older culture got this year and they said, well, they, they had slavery and it's just so your subjective opinion that's wrong. It's like, no, think of it the same way. Is that we've discovered moral facts about the world that have you know, allowed us to paint us a clearer picture about you know, um, how we can use and uh, discover the, these said moral facts. Well, okay. So uh, th thank you, Saka, for bringing that up. Um, because uh, I think that this kind of highlights the differences in the two different subjects that we're talking about here. Because, like, for instance, there is an absolute age to the earth, to the universe, all of that. And we have absolute ways of figuring that out, or at least as absolute as we can get. Like, we can use radiocarbon dating, or not radiocarbon dating, uh, radiometric dating in order to, you know, date uh, rocks and, and crystals and stuff like that to figure out, you know, how old the earth is. There's other there's other various ways uh, to date how old uh, the the Earth is, and so we can uh, we can absolutely or at least as absolute as we can prove th that particular fact. But the problem with morality is, uh, you know, ba basically what what Shannon was saying um, uh, this entire time is that it's based on our own, you know, uh, our, our own our own cognition, our our, our own. Uh, subjective sense of morality. So to say that something is absolutely right or wrong uh, that exists outside of ourselves, I, I think overlooks the fact that at any one point in time, you know, it, the, the absoluteness is subjectively defined by, you know, us as humans, like what we consider them to be and maybe shannon's gonna prove me wrong right here no i'm not actually i'm just raising my hand before Sokka gets back in god damn it <laughs> I, I told you i'm gonna minimize it so go ahead shannon <laughs> i was like well there's the rest of the night i love you Sokka. so to me there's a difference between the two and maybe this will help articulate my perspective which i think is in line with kind of what ge just said and maybe entirely in line with G what G just said, you can let me know G. <coughs> Pardon me. So the way I look at it, the age of the earth is something that is a fact that's accessible outside of us. We can continue to test it in ways that are um, falsifiable. So we can, we can conduct a mathematic analysis. We can do trigonometry. We can do science stuff. I don't, I don't know a lot about trigonometry and geometry and whatever. It's not, it's not my field, but we can do things and get results 
from those things that give us an absolute answer that is like, this is the case or this is not the case based on a set of facts that does not change over time. Like they're going to be constant. We can discover more once we realize how to assess those facts. But that doesn't like that fact doesn't change. Now, when we're looking at morality, there's nothing external to us that I can tell that we are assessing. What we're assessing is entirely how we perceive behaviors to be right or wrong, good or bad, based on the context that we're in and what the outcomes are. But the fun, right. Mm -hmm. And Does that makes sense. You see that differentiation that I articulate that well enough that you can see like, it, like you can't give me a frame of reference outside of me that says like morality is out here and we're, we're like, we're inching closer to morality, which is here. Like what we used to be here and now we're here. We're almost to moral. Whereas like the age of the earth, we had no idea. And now, oh yeah, we know. Right. And the, the idea there is human flourishing though. That is outside of ourselves. What the Greeks would call a daimonia. The age of the earth isn't subjective. It's, it, it is an absolute fact. We, de we right. determine that that's what we want based on consensus, the, the likelihood that generally that's what we all want, even though there are notable exceptions to that being the case. And even once we agree upon that being the goal, once we contextualize and look at the nuance, that goal can start to break down based on situational circumstances and how we have to, as individuals, weigh outcomes for ourselves and others in every individual choice that we make. Like if it's if morality is absolute, we carry it with us every day, all day, and we should have access to it somehow, as opposed to us, you know, just doing well, the we, best we can based on cost benefit analysis with what little knowledge we have available to us. We do have we do have access, and we do have various tools that we use to. How? <laughs> that's uh, that's going to require a semester of moral philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk again next year then, Cal and you and I. <laughs> but basically, I um, the short part of it is that outside of us is human flourishing. Now, whether you find this flourishing necessarily to be good or not, mm -hmm. and whether that will depend, I suppose, on whether you value that society to be flourishing or not. If you don't value a society to be flourishing, then, well... You okay. have a different system, but that doesn't change. If I that doesn't so if I if I can present something here. Um so human society has flourished under a different moral systems that we would subjectively say are abhorrent now. I mean, human flourishing happened uh, you know, while slavery not, was a yeah, thing. Not to the degree that it could have, though. That's the whole point. You can still Immoral stuff happens all the time. People make moral mistakes all the time. The whole point is is to is that these mistakes, while they have a cost, they don't necessarily override other things that are also being done. Is That's that right? Sense? Yeah. So in the same way to the example I brought up earlier is that the just because uh, there's certain radiometric dating that can date the Earth to a certain age, but if there's better radiometric dating that would produce better, more accurate results, you know, depending on how old you know, the Earth is. So, I mean, it, it's the same thing. Uh, is that, uh, we're going to hear, is that um, you, it, it, we're not, it, it, Kaylin's not saying that uh, the, you know, you wouldn't see any type of flourishing out there. It's just that there would be some type of example, of like almost like an right. ideal uh, flourishing. Right. Uh, Kaylin, do you believe that? Uh, close to ideal, yes. Okay, yeah. so there, there, there does exist like this, uh, this objectively ideal society that flourishes in such a way that uh, would be the kind of like the, what the, the goal is. So whenever we do make any type of action or movement towards more flourishing, we're moving closer to this goal of this perfectly flourishing society. Well, uh, so, I mean, I guess my next question would be how, how do we ascertain what is the ideal flourishing society? like situation or like what, what's the ideal level of flourishing it's a state called eudaimonia which is metaphysically grounded in the science of positive psychology that's the that's the night that's the quickest answer <laughs> that i can give because i i think we're coming up on the um hour um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to jump in a quick second there, Kaylin, and um, that, uh, so we're going to be shutting this down in about 20 minutes. 
hey, you guys don't hit each other. That's <laughs> um, And so uh, I'm just going to reach out now to the audience. Like, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask the panel um, over the next uh, couple minutes while we'll, we're we'll wrapping up this discussion here, I'm going to collect uh, some from the audience to ask uh, anybody that uh, – anybody. So just wow. you guys carry on. Sorry. Um, so I don't know if Shannon heard the answer, but yeah, basically – it's a state that is acquired by acquiring the virtues and it's all grounded in positive psychology. That's the, that's well, the quickest, think, most time efficient answer I can give. Well, I, I understand that, but I feel like if there's an ideal state of flourishing, I feel like there should be some kind of concrete like answer to it. Cause like you can measure human flourishing, uh, you know, the flourishing of societies, you can measure how much they grow. You can measure, all these different things. And I, I mean, don't know that answer. Like like that, that, uh, again, like I said, in order for the sake of time, most I'm going to be able to say, and I'm sure you could develop psychometrics or and whatnot for it. But the area of positive psychology is where the um, metaphysical grounding lies in terms of acquisition of the virtues. <sighs> what, what are the conversation. <laughs> I was, I'm being told to direct you to the private chat count. <laughs> oh, I, am. I just, I still can't get to, maybe it's just a catch up in my head that it all seems like if we agree upon this is the goal, right. because oh, we, um, I guess this is the goal. I'm supposed to swap out. Okay. Oh, oh, somebody wants to come fight me probably, or GE, more likely GE. <laughs> sure, I'll swap out. Okay. Sure, I'll swap out. I think people have had enough of me. I've never, no. never, never no. enough. Uh, not at all. Uh, actually, uh, we... It was wonderful talking to you uh, as always. Yeah. And we'll probably have a conversation on this on the future if you want, because it's a yeah. It's, it's cool. an interesting, very technical and very um, nuanced and important topic too. Figuring out what we should do as a society and as a species is it's probably important. Yeah. Conversations for just topic. a little bit, a little bit, kind of, no, whatever. So also answer the question. You're not answering the question. <laughs> That's our ship. The answer is snake. <laughs> Morality is grounded in the snake. Yes. Anything that <laughs> harms a snake is automatically immoral and needs to be obliterated from the face of the earth. Nothing else matters. There. You're not the objective <laughs> morality. Something we finally can all agree on. About time. <laughs> oh, th uh, thank you very much, Caitlin. I really appreciate you having you on. Yeah, no problem. Oh, ha, this guy. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> hey, guys. How's it going? Shannon and G. Got, we've Good only got 20 minutes jump. left, and T jumps here. Jesus. So I'm just Everybody gonna, mute. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't I, I don't think I've ever met uh, – uh, sorry, how do you pronounce it? T jump? Uh, uh, it's before, T so. jump. My name's Tom Jump, so it's just the T is just the first letter oh, of my first okay. name. So. Okay. Yeah, I, that, that makes sense. I'm actually S Oc account, and it just people always screw it up as well. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Shannon, you said that you don't believe you believe all moral statements are contextual, and that there's no like objective yeah. statement that could be like true in all cases. And yeah. So, so I far would, as I understand, currently, yeah. But I'm open to whatever. Yeah. yeah. My position is that there is an objective statement that just applies universally, which is just any immoral action is always going to involve involuntary impositions of someone's will or their property. And so just if you list every possible immoral action, they will all have that one property 100% of the time. Without any contextualization, like there's no context in which someone can have an involuntary imposition of their will be moral. Uh, not necessarily. Like um, all roses are flowers, not all flowers are roses. So there could potentially be one of those, maybe. But for a fact, guaranteed 100% of the time, every immoral action will necessarily involve an involuntary imposition of will. So every immoral action involves an involuntary imposition of will, but there can be involuntary impositions of will that are not immoral. Potentially. Like if somebody is just running around stabbing people, stopping them would be an involuntary imposition on their will because they want to run around stabbing people. But I feel like that would be the moral thing to do, right? So is it immoral to stop somebody from stabbing? 
yes, we can go with yes. But again, so my argument is just that every immoral action you ever list will always have this one property. Now, there are definitely moral actions that could also have this property, and it would be like a small subset of those or whatever. But every immoral action will always be described with that one sentence without exception. Well, I mean, that just results in everything being immoral. Um, no, I'm not. It's not so like, Except for running around doing whatever you want. No, no, no. So like, take your example of stopping someone from stabbing someone. That would be moral. That's a moral example of an involuntary imposition of will. Well, no, but I just time. said, so, sorry, I, I, I interrupted. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That's fine. Well, it's just that I, I had just said a minute ago that like stopping somebody from stabbing people, like er, you said, every immoral action would have an involuntary imposition of will. So stopping somebody from stabbing somebody would be an invo it, it would be, it would it would make it immoral because it's an involuntary like imposition of will remember what i'm saying here is not that any involuntary imposition is immoral i'm saying that any immoral action will involve an involuntary imposition so you're it's saying like, that's a quality of an immoral action yes yes it's necessary okay. sure, so, so, have that quality. So, so tj let me let me ask you this question because it actually got brought up earlier then so a voluntary <laughs> A voluntary human sacrifice. Yeah, okay. Sorry, a voluntary human sacrifice would be completely moral. Would be yeah, if you voluntarily choose to sacrifice yourself, that's totally moral. There's no immorality there. So the the Aztecs, like uh, what? So how about this one? What happens if it was for something that was not true? The, a culture that believed that a a human sacrifice was needed to bring the rain, and so people would gladly volunteer them for themselves. Um, for a good harvest so they're they're essentially they're sacrificing themselves for something that is just not uh, true at all if they voluntarily chose to it i would say it's not immoral but i don't think i'm not sure if any of them actually did it voluntarily in the aztecs but if they did then it wouldn't be immoral so committing action you know uh so you would not think that uh, committing an action based off of false information could ever be immoral as long as you did it voluntarily? Essentially, yeah. So, I mean, like people choose to give up all of their life savings to televangelists. I don't think it's immoral for them to do that. I wouldn't um, criminalize them from doing that or or uh, judge them for that action. It's their choice to do so. Even though, but would you, you know, would you consider the televangelists themselves to be immoral? Yeah, for sure. But what I wouldn't consider, makes, to answer his question, he was like, if the people that choose to give their money up for something false. Yeah. I mean, I don't consider that action to be immoral. So their choice to do something based off of false information isn't immoral, even if the person deceiving them may be immoral. I think the reason that he may have posed that is to contextualize it. Like, is that situation, like, is there an immoral, is there an immoral agent in that situation? Potentially, yeah. I mean, you'd have to know more about the situation. What well, if the person that's doing the sacrificing believes the same thing that the person that's being sacrificed is doing? What if the televangelist legitimately believes that giving all of your money to them is going to give God God's grace upon you? Like, is there is there an immoral action there? I have no idea. I'd have to like think about it more. Like, so maybe that we can um, kind of th think of it this way: is that, um. With the, the uh, with the how in your system uh, that you're proposing here, how would you define morality itself, or something something being immoral? How would you define that? Uh, immorality would be an involuntary position of will in general. Okay. Well, yeah, but I mean, that goes back to something that I said. I mean, that just means that everything's immoral. Because in what in one sense or another, you're going to be involuntary. You're going to have an involuntary imposition of will. Well, remember, like, how, how would you how would you be able to? to so, uh, I guess in this case, then. Well, apologies yeah. just to answer GE. So again, I'm saying that every immoral action has an involuntary imposition of will, but I'm not saying in this argument that every involuntary imposition of will is immoral. Those are two different statements. Do you? Well, um, well no. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I keep interrupting you. I'm so no, go sorry. for it. Go on. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to step back. My bad. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I guess I just fail to see how you can really make any kind of moral predictions about things like, or, or make any kind of moral judgments based on that. Because like in the situation with the preacher and the person giving the money to the preacher, 
I mean, you're basically just subdividing that issue down to like individual issues and judging that as whether or not it's right or wrong. But then like with the preacher, I mean, you still have to contextualize it as to, you know, what, like, like that the motives and, and uh, I guess um, will or whatnot of the preacher, because if he's knowingly deceiving people, then you would consider that immoral, I guess. And, and then if he's not, if he's not willfully deceiving people, that would be a morally good action, I guess. Or neutral. Well, or I'm neutral. not. So I'm not really. I really didn't follow the analogy with the preacher and how I would articulate that. But again, so my argument is kind of like all roses are flowers, but not all flowers are roses. So I'm saying that all immoral actions will have an involuntary imposition of will. So it's a small like Venn diagram kind of a thing, a little bubble. And then there's a bigger bubble of all involuntary impositions of will. And some of them may also be moral, like a different bubble. So so when I asked you the question earlier about how would you, you know, when everyone else is done. how would you define an immoral action? Then you, you were actually in, you were you you made a mistake then. Because no. you, you no, because you just said that not all um uh I'm sorry, uh how do you phrase it? You did. Not all involuntary impositions of will are immoral. Yeah, sorry. So I, I think you, I get I, it. I asked, I asked you, what is oh, what is immoral? And you said an involuntary imposition of will. In general. And in general. I said that. In the, yeah. So so the, right. the so how I'm that. defining it is by starting with, so we can identify this one property that is in every single one of them. And this is the identifying feature that we can start with as a basis to define what it is. Right, but so, you can't you can't define something as immoral. You can't you can't define immorality in in that way, if it includes kind of things in that category that you are saying yourself are not immoral. No, no, no. I can't define it completely in that way, but it can use it as a starting point. Like I can't define all flowers as plants because it's too general. But I can say that flowers are plants. So it's one way to start the process of giving a definition. So again, but I wanted to just, the part I'm trying to make here is that there is a particular statement that can be said, which will apply universally to all immoral actions, which is what Shannon said, there was no such statement. And so that's the part I'm arguing. Okay, yeah, that's why I wanted to try it. Once Sock is done moderating. <laughs> I'm done, sorry. Go, 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 ahead, go ahead, Shannon. Uh, I just want to let you guys know uh, we're, we're going we're, uh, we're to try to wrap this up in about the next five minutes. i got a couple questions that we're going to do at that point. Okay, so that's an interesting conversation to have because I, it seems as though <laughs> some, yes. somebody made a Euler. <laughs> Snakes, the correct. That's correct. <laughs> Snakes. I love it. Oh, Callan, I love Callan. Um, so it seems to me that you've identified something that's potentially a quality or a property of what people perceive as immoral actions. Is that sure. a fair statement? Sure. So you've identified something that you haven't found an exception to that whenever somebody makes a moral proposition is a component of what they feel is aki about or makes that makes it bad sure okay fair yep. so uh, so i get what you're saying there but still to me and if you can understand my perspective all of that still falls back to perception to me right i totally because understand. the reason that which is why i think like you can say that almost universally we haven't found an exception to people that say the reason that i find something immoral is because there's some aspect of imposition of will that is is a contributing factor to my assessment of why I, I've deemed this proposition to be immoral as opposed to moral. Like that's an aspect that may be universally um, available in all of those determinations, but it, those are still determinations, which means that it falls back to an individual's subjective perspective. And, you know, there's an argument to be made on if, you know, if you can't find an exception for somebody saying for imposition of will being unilaterally a component of every one of those assessments all the way across the board, if you can't find an exception to that, that may be a good argument to, to discuss and delve into further. But still, ultimately, it's grounded in and that's where I'm like, there's nothing outside of me. You remove humans and there is no imposition of will and there is no morality. All right, absolutely. I totally right? Like that's, that's my perspective. And all, the only reason that any of it makes sense, even if imposition of will is something universally we apply to it now, 
maybe, maybe down the line, we'll have a perceptual shift in our cognitive function that allows us for whatever reason to have these conversations where imposition of will is potentially a good thing. I can't conceptualize why that might be the case, but I also can't completely discount that it's impossible or improbable even for that to be the case when we look at the contextualizations of the societies that are making these moral propositions. Do, does all of that make sense? And do you feel like I understood you? Oh, absolutely. I totally agree okay. with all of that. So my argument, you're absolutely right that we don't have like an ontological ground of morality, right. like an undiscovered law of nature or something could be out uh -huh. there, but we don't have that. All we have is our intuitions and perceptions, yes. uh, psychology essentially. But the only argument that I wanted to bring that I wanted that I took issue with is when you said that there is no objective principle that applies universally. They're always contextualized. That part, I think I can show false, which is with my one example of all- Because you think action. there are no exceptions to that that anybody can provide. Right, right. As far as I know. So I, I can't prove that. Absolutely. It's just an inductive- That may be fair. That, and I, it's, it's I, interesting. I have, but... I have one more challenge to uh, teach you. I'm going to okay. get your, get your response mute. to it. Sock okay. is moderating again. Everybody shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. moderating real, here. Real quick, no. Saki, can we get to this question so I can take it off the screen? You were yes, killing uh, I, I have it. I have it copied and pasted, by the way. So I, if I don't get to it, then I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Um, driving drunk, moral or immoral? Um, I would say only immoral in the face because we it has an impact on others. So if we could... <laughs> So that that's under. I, I didn't say that you hit somebody. I just said driving drunk. Oh, so yeah, just driving drunk. If you never hit anybody, I would say it's not immoral. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you. Cool. Okay, that's so consistent, though. that's consistent. That is, it is consistent. It's about outcomes, not right. potential outcomes. Um, so we're gonna get some questions. Um, the first one is because uh, Shannon Q is uh, here to. Hi, I'm to, here. Who Shannon Q? Okay. <laughs> Being that you are into psychology and stuff, I, I added the end stuff, stuff just because <laughs> in chunk or like, whatever, <laughs> like psychology, like you know, stuff. Uh, exactly. How do you explain similar justice systems or the golden rule? It seems like those are some shared ideas across cultures. It's almost like all cultures have humans in them, or something. <laughs> That's how I'd explain that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think he's asking like the same kind of thing I was, where he said there's this one principle that does seem to apply universally, which is the golden rule or whatever. I well, yeah, I but I mean, that's that would be a lot like saying building pyramids is like a some kind of a universal thing that exists outside ourselves. I, I think that there are certain things that just uh, n just naturally, uh, I guess, occur. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of like morality in general, uh, just sort of naturally uh, occurring um, in, in sentient beings. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I would think that it's just something that would naturally occur, the golden rule or these concepts that help uh, society flourish or or whatnot. I, I do think that there is some evolutionary advantages to these types of rules as well. Uh, and that's probably why they seem innate or outside of ourselves, uh, I guess, now, is that through <coughs> the evolution of our species through societies, I think that, you know, it's kind of cultivated this sort of sense. And also the fact that in our societies, we kind of quarantine off those that don't share, like, the general sense of the golden rule or, or these other things that we consider to be, I guess, absolute or objective. So like if those people actually built their own society, they'd come up with something different than the golden rule. And so it's only prevalent in all our societies because those are the ones that survive. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would say that that's a prime component of most societies now. And I think that you could definitely find uh, societies now that aren't as, uh, successful that prob that that wouldn't employ you know those pretty basic um, ideas, but I do think that they're societally based. Should I answer? <laughs> it's posed to me. <laughs> um, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think it's societally based. I d I'll I'll just I'll just agree. Because I've lost track of what the question was initially, but I think it had to do with the psychology. Um, well, the golden and rule and, and golden why rule being universal. Societies have that. Yeah, I think it's because we all in, intentional. It, 
innately or not all and not all of us there's exceptions to everything like there's sociopaths or psychopaths i think that innately most of us the, the lion's share of us the mass proportion of us statistically all have self-preservation as a natural instinct and we understand that in order to continue to survive we're best operating within a cohesive functional group because we don't operate well independently. So it's best for us to be able to exist within a society and adhere to a certain set of rules and standards in order to be accepted in that society so that we are not cast out from the society, which would be a detriment to us. And we've learned over time that not treating each other like shit is a good way to continue to be accepted so the do one to others as you would have them do one to you just seems like a fundamental sort of um way of being a natural self-preservation if you just start people are always like well everybody would just steal and rob if there wasn't some sort of act well no they wouldn't because there'd be immediate consequences because people don't like being stolen from people don't like being killed people don't like being raped people don't like uh being even spoken to with tone so if you start to treat people in a manner that they uh deem unacceptable you'll reap immediate consequences and not garner the benefits of that group so why would you if you're smart enough to understand that you garner benefits from existing within the group and the group recognizes that they garner benefits from you being a member of it and you can prove that they do and they feel as though that's you know acceptable then that's how societies work and function. And that's why we need moral systems so that they can stay coherent. Because if we all start just treating each other like crap, we all scatter to the wind and kill each other. And then there is no more society. So I guess that's my perspective psychologically. It's cost benefit analysis. And it seems kind of like innate and good, good, almost goes without saying. <laughs> Unless you're president. Unless you're president, unless you unless you somehow manage to make it to a point of power where you don't have to operate within a society because you have a position of privilege that allows you to have control over other people because you're in a leadership position. But for all the all the rest of us peons, we have to we have to get along with each other. Shannon's Sh president. Sh Shannon, we're, Shannon, we're, we're Canadian. We're supposed I'm to just like, Canadian we're, as we're, 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 we're Prime just Minister. Smile, yeah, smile and nod at uh, the, our unfortunate, uh, uh, what I, the, the, the traitorous colonist to the South. Hey, shame. that's the colonist still. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> the kids are killing me. I love them. <laughs> Were there any other... Did I, did I do, is there anything that, I think most, the three of us actually, I think kind of agree, like we all just gave different variations and extrapolated upon the, the response to that question. So I don't think that there's much diversity of opinion when it comes to this here. <laughs> We're all shaking our heads along to each other's answers. <laughs> so, for, um, for, for Shannon and, and yeah, Godless for there, um, would, do you think that society would function better <laughs> under the illusion yeah, of moral true. facts being true? No, you, go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I was going to ask, clarify the question. Uh, do I think that society is under the illusion that moral facts? No, would we think function I, better if oh. we operated under the illusion that there were such a thing as moral facts and we adhered to them because we thought well, they were true? No, I, no, I, I definitely don't think so because, um, I, I, at least for me, because, I mean, then who gets to dictate these facts? I mean, then you then you have people that are subjectively defining what these facts are, and then you end up with things like, oh, it's you know, it's an ob objective moral fact that you can own another person, and then you have the slave trade, and you know that existed for you know thousands of years. I, I, I mean, you still it still comes down to who is given the authority to define these. Uh, absolute or or uh, facts if they're an illusion then you definitely have somebody that is defining what is a moral fact and what isn't well here's an interesting question do you think there are a certain set of facts that if society believed they were objective would make society better uh no can i i'll answer the question and i think my answer will actually answer your question too sure so 
let's just say I'm going to operate under a hypothetical here. So let's just say that hypothetically, we all currently came to a consensus. There was this, this big epiphany aha moment. We all sung Kumbaya and held hands and all the way around the world. We're in a circle just going, we got it, guys. We got it. We figured out what objective morals are. We fucking did it. And all of us agreed and we wrote them down on a tome and we figured it out. We, we, or at least we thought we did. And we, and we have our objective moral facts and we wrote them down and this is, these are them for eternity. That's it. We got it. Nailed it. That's the one guys. Now, those are the objective moral facts in every context for the rest of time. Now, society don't, doesn't just exist now that may operate to maybe help flourish our functioning now, but there's no guarantee that over the course of time immemorial that society as it's constituted currently is going to remain in this, this static uh, way of operating. And it also removes our ability to assess the, con the context and validity of those facts. Once we've determined that they are facts and they're just absolutes that we are to adhere to, and we convince societies that they should be adhered to, then they become prescriptive imperatives and if they're prescriptive imperatives, that opens up risk for anybody who deviates from them, even if they have legitimate reasons, because those legitimate reasons are no longer assessed in the same fashion as if we understand that they are to be assessed ad hoc as they come up. So that is my answer. Does anybody have any objections to that answer? I would object, but I don't want to drag Nobody on the cares what you think, T-Jump. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good because like conversations like this are always good at being able to branch out and have future discussions for people that find this topic sure. interesting. So, I mean, the, the, the fact that uh, uh, we're walking out of this unresolved in the issue, just like every philosopher for the last you know, 3,000 years, is good um, because it allows uh, more topics to discuss. Um, so on, on that, I'm going to just uh, start closing this off now. I want to thank everybody here for uh, for joining the discussion. Uh, Callan, uh, thank you for being here as well. I'm, I know they're not here anymore. Um, and I'm going to give uh, you guys a... Uh, you know, get uh, off just, the table. <laughs> just go through here. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, have any type of closing statements, uh, go over to that now. Uh, starting with, we'll start with T-Jump because they came in here first. And then uh, we'll, we'll work our way around the room. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh Thanks for having me on. I really appreciated the conversation. Thanks for Shannon and G for talking with me. I really appreciate it. Love the Batman outfit, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, if anybody Just wants nice. to go to my channel, come to youtube.com slash T jump. That's where I do debates. And I'd love to follow up, have a follow up conversation with Shannon about the objective morality thing. Yeah, sure. Sometime. Find free time for me. That's a, that, that, that is a <laughs> fine free time. Then sure. Absolutely. Okay, well, we'll go to uh, Shannon. Uh, anything to uh, close with? Uh, my name is Shannon Q, and I have a channel called Shannon Q because I'm really, really creative. Really creative. And I talk about a multitude of issues. I have complex conversations on controversial issues to try to model better dialogues. Uh, and I also talk about the intersection of psychology and faith. And oh, actually, on Sunday, I have Dr. Luke Jennison on, um, who is a Christian materialist who has, who is actually like a, a medical doctor. He was recently on the Unbelievable podcast. Uh, I can't remember who he was talking to because it slipped my mind right now, debating another Christian philosopher about um, why he sees the soul as an emergent property of the material mind as opposed to, like, so he doesn't subscribe to substance dualism so but is a christian so i'm going to have a conversation with him about how he reconciles that because i find it fascinating and they interrupted each other so much in that conversation that i really couldn't get to the meat of what his perspective is so that's happening this sunday on my channel if you guys are interested in conceptualizations of the soul and listening to how a christian uh gets to a soul as an emergent property of physiological function because and he's met, it's really cool he's a professor i think at mcmaster so yeah that's the next thing that i'm doing if anybody wants to go see it on, on sunday okay and uh godless engineer all right uh so i'm godless engineer you can find me here on youtube at godless engineer as well as pretty much any other social media uh platform out there i'm just godless engineer uh on my channel i talk about atheism and uh just other religious topics. Um, another a really big topic that I talk about is mythicism. So if you're interested in the history of, uh, of Christianity in the first century, definitely go and uh, check me out over there.
Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys all here. Uh, uh, my apologies again. Uh, obviously, a little bit of technical difficulties there at the beginning with uh, Nate's mic. Uh, I'm not a regular fixer, so I'm sure he'll be back next week and we'll be free of my children uh, wrestling and banging stuff in the background. What are the best? They made this. They made my day. <laughs> so on, on that note, I I don't pop up very often. I did pop up earlier. Um, I usually vet people before they come on the show uh, for that very reason. And uh, that's that's on me, folks. That's on me. I did not bet that guy at all. Uh, and so I do have to apologize. And I did personally apologize to to Kaylin uh, and some of you others who were here uh, privately. But I want to publicly uh, apologize. And in fact, he was very upset with me and sent me a message here that I want to share. Oh, there goodness. you go. Uh, he shared that with me a little while ago and then blocked uh, the magic sandwich show on Facebook. So, oh my goodness, that's his response. So, some of you did not see or hear what happened before uh, we went live. He actually got into it with Kalen over something that was uh, honestly ridiculous, trivial, uh, act absolutely trivial, and it was just cantankerous the entire time. So, um, from that moment, I was watching and listening to him, and he gave me plenty of reason to remove him. So. He had no interest in actually having a genuine conversation, so I don't have time for him. Uh, but on that note, uh, unfortunately, I will be putting Magic Sandwich Show on hiatus for a while. Uh, I do have some real life stuff kind of going on. This is my last full semester, and uh, I'm going to be kind of shifting focus for a bit. So uh, we're going to be continuing these types of conversations, but they're going to be happening on these channels down here. You see all these people below me? they're going to be having these type of conversations. You may even see me come on. You may even see me actually talk about biochemistry for once. Uh, so uh, on that note, oh, uh, some of you were here from the Atheist Experience. I will be back on the Atheist Experience April 5th. Uh, so there's that. But yeah, if you guys like these types of conversations, please uh, let these folks know on the tweeters. Uh, let them know uh, via email. Uh, however it is that they feels comfortable <clears throat> to get in contact with them uh, on Twitch. I think uh, T-Jump, you do Twitch as well, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, I'm getting into Twitch. So please follow people on uh, those platforms to kind of keep abreast as to what's going on. So I do want to uh, thank everybody who participated. And if you are feeling, if you are walking away from this discussion and you're feeling, you know what, this may be out of my depth. I, I want to actually tell you a little bit of something. I'm not going to go on a long soliloquy. This is not my channel. But when I first started entering these conversations, you guys can go to this very channel and find me almost seven years ago talking to DPR Jones and some others, and I have no idea what I'm talking about. I know very little about science, and now I can give lectures in biochemistry. It is a... The thing that you have to understand about the nature of the discourse, if you want to learn, if you want to immerse yourself and have these conversations, it requires you to get your hands dirty. It requires you to dip your toe into the water and you're going to be wrong. You're going to find many videos on my own channel where I'm just wrong. Don't be afraid of that. If you genuinely want to learn some of this stuff, there are resources. Uh, there are people who come to my Discord just just to try to learn some of the stuff. Actually, Shannon Q, you were in my Discord yeah. uh, earlier this week to try and. Uh, I asked everybody to come in and yell at me about morality until I could figure some stuff. Out. <laughs> but everybody, come tell me why I'm wrong. That yeah. is useful. There's yeah. there's a use to that. So that's something that I definitely want to nurture. Uh, if you guys think T Jump is wrong, say fuck T Jump. You know what? I want to challenge yeah, him on that. Fuck and he's T Jump. Gonna welcome it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's that's the nature. Make, that make Paul jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Paul doesn't get jealous. He knows what's up. <laughs> he doesn't have need. <laughs> but no, that's 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 good. Like that, people should want that. So if if this is something that you want, you say, you know what, my lane isn't really science. You know, I'm into the philosophy. Then reach out. Right. Definitely reach out because there's plenty of folks out here who definitely want to teach folks. So um, on that note, does anybody else have anything else to add? No. OK. I'm, uh, I'm going to head over to Skylar Fiction's channel and put my foot up someone's butt. So <gasps> yay! I might watch that. <laughs> yes. 
I'm feeling especially mean because I didn't get to say what I wanted to say about that person. So. Oh, I don't even know who it is. Now I'm now I'm definitely probably gonna watch oh, that. Oh, uh, Perusha, whoever his name, what that guy earlier. I didn't get to say what I wanted to say to him. Oh, but, uh, so you oh. get a high eight, you get a brief intermission. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna oh, go and take care of some business. So, on that note, please subscribe to the channels, folks. Thank y'all for watching, and we'll see y'all eventually.